Hey, welcome to the Tabernacle. My name is Martin. I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want to welcome you, uh, whether you're visiting or this is the way that you get to enjoy church. We know that uh, things look a little bit different for everybody these days, but we're really glad that you checked us out. Uh, we do have three physical locations, one in Buckley, one in Manistee, and one brand new in Cadillac. So to invite you, if it works out for you, check one of those out. Come meet us in person. I promise it'll be a lot of fun, and, well, maybe I'm taller in person. We'd love to uh, get to know you one way or the other, though, and uh, we hope that you're blessed by this service. Consider it a gift from us to you. Good morning, Tabernacle. It's always a good morning when it's Sunday morning and the sun's out and someone gives you beef jerky at the front door. That just happened, Ricky Bobby, and it was delicious. And I didn't share with anybody. So uh, uh, my name is John. I'm one of the pastors. I want to welcome uh, those who are worshiping with us in Manistee and in Cadillac. Over the last three weeks, I've gotten to be at every single one of the campuses. And it's interesting how many people I don't know, and that's a good thing. God's doing an awesome thing here. And we have a great staff to serve and love and care for our congregation. But he's also brought so many new faces. And we're all different, different communities. I found out that the Cadillac campus, they're the wild ones, all right? A little bit on the edge there. I don't know, have something to do with Pastor Isaac. He's a freak show, but it's really... <laughs> In a good way, in a good way. I love that guy. But um, uh, yeah, so coming up next Sunday night, uh, we're going to hold an event we call Merge at Our Church. And if, if you're relatively new to the church or, or if you've never been to Merge, we'd love for you to sign up. We'd love for you to be a part of this. I know you've heard about this the last couple weeks, but uh, it's amazing how many people think we're trying to trick you. Merge is an on-ramp to our church. You find out about our statement of faith, what we believe, why we believe it. Uh, you can ask questions about our structure, anything that you want to know. If you're in the process of trying to decide, do I want this church to be my church? You need to come to Merch. Uh, we're doing it live uh, this time, so all of our staff will be there. Uh, you'll hear from all of our lead teachers and about the structure of the church. There'll be a dinner. You'll get to know some other people. It's also a requirement for membership, and so I want to encourage you to be a part of that. We want to pack this room out. It should be a lot of fun. Uh, it'll start at 4. I know you'll all be here at 2, but... Um, just how we are up here, I guess, and you'll be out by eight o'clock. So you can sign up online or sign up at the hub. If you have a Bible or a flat screen, we're going to be back in our study in 1 Kings. So if you'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 13, we're going to look at a rather, and I'll admit this, bizarre story in the Old Testament. It's a bizarre story. And, and, and in the study, I'm glad I've had two weeks, there's some things for us, but you got to stick with the story. It's, it's a weird one. A thing to help us understand is I thought I'd pull out a map. Men love maps, and so uh, I want you to have a little map of where we are in 1 Kings. If we can flash that up there real quick. Israel has essentially divided into two kingdoms. This is because of the sin of Solomon and because of the continued sin of his son Rehoboam. And also, we're going to see the sin of Jeroboam. Israel is falling apart. It's a divided kingdom. The southern part... That's where the line of David will continue, and that's essentially called Judah from here on out in 1 Kings. And that's where Rehoboam is king. His capital is Jerusalem, and, and this is basically one tribe and part of another, part of Judah, or all of Judah and part of Benjamin. They've stayed loyal to the sons of David. The northern kingdom, this is not of the line of David, the rebel kingdom, as it were, None of you got the Star Wars reference? Oh, you didn't have jerky. Okay, got it, yeah. So the northern kingdom, that's where Jeroboam is, and he's leading God's people into idol worship. He's not trusting God. They've both had the truth. They're both turning away, but particularly in the north, Jeroboam has set up altars to false gods. He's established a false priesthood. 
And where the story goes today, because actually the next couple chapters, is this Israel, is this Judah? We're going to keep throwing up a map for the dudes because we're visual. Can I get an amen? amen? Okay, sweet. So a guy's coming from Judah to prophesy to the northern kingdom. So without any more map talk, let's go to 1 Kings chapter 13. We'll read all of it, but take a few breaks uh, so we can explain some things. It says, and behold, a man of God came out of Judah, that's the southern yellow, by the word of the Lord to Bethel. Jeroboam, king in the north, was standing by the altar to make offerings. And the man cried against the altar by the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus says the Lord, behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he shall sacrifice on you the priests of the high places who make offerings on you. And human bones shall be burned on you. And he gave a sign the same day saying, this is the sign that the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be torn down and the ashes that are on it shall be poured out. And when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar at Bethel, Jeroboam stretched out his hand from the altar saying, seize him. And his hand, which he stretched out against him, dried up so that he could not draw it back to himself. Some translations say it withered. The altar also was torn down and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign that the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king said to the man of God, entreat now the favor of the Lord your God and pray for me that my hand may be restored to me. And the man of God entreated the Lord and the king's hand was restored to him and it became as it was before. And the king said to the man of God, come home with me and refresh yourself and I will give you a reward. And the man of God said to the king, if you give me half your house, I will not go in with you and I will not eat bread or drink water in this place. For so is it commanded me by the word of the Lord saying, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water nor return by the way that you came. So he went another way and did not return by the way that he came to Bethel. So let's pause right there so our eyes don't glaze over and we get confused. So one thing that's repeated over and over and over you'll see is by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord, by the word of the Lord. Hebrews chapter one verse two says that in, in old days, the word of the Lord came by many prophets. In these last days, it comes by his son, Jesus. So we have to kind of put our Old Testament minds on here. The word of the Lord is coming to men to speak prophecy to other people. So this man of God, this prophet, comes from the southern kingdom by the word of the Lord to prophesy against this altar, this altar of false worship that Jeroboam has set up. And he says, altar, altar. There's gonna come one from the line of David and he names him, his name will be Josiah and he will sacrifice these false priests on these altars that you have made, this abomination to God. That's what he's saying. Now King Jeroboam, who's set all this false worship up, he's freaking out. He's not worshiping the one true God. He set up this false religion in order to control people. And before the King of Kings series, Pastor Adam preached a brilliant message on trust about that. And so he hears this and he says, seize that man, arrest him. Heresy, stop it, get the Gestapo out here, seize him. In that moment, his hand withers. That's like X-Men stuff. <laughs> or one of the Marvel movies I didn't watch, whatever. He's frozen. At the same time, the sign that he promised, because signs accompanied the word of the Lord before God's written word, the altar was torn down and the ashes were poured out. And so we have a busted down, poured out, ashes, altar, and a frozen hand. Then the wicked king says to the man of God, hey, would you pray to your God that my hand would be restored? I mean, the gall of some people, right? But he does it. Oh, thank you. You want to come to dinner? So think about how many signs that guy has gotten. Frozen hand, that's one. Unfrozen hand, that's two. Busted altar, that's three. No repentance, no change of heart. Hey, let's do dinner. We don't know what his motives are. 
But repeat it over and over. Don't miss this. The word of the Lord said to him, not only this prophecy, but he was told, when you travel up into that kingdom, don't eat, don't drink, don't stop, and come home by a different way. And so he refuses the invitation because he'd been given specific instructions by the word of the Lord. Is everybody still with me? Don't worry, it gets weirder. (laughs) I'm just saying, it does. But we can do this. Verse 11. Now an old prophet lived in Bethel and his sons came and told him all that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told to their father the words that he'd spoken to the king. And their father said to them, which way did he go? And his son showed him the way that the man of God who came from Judah had gone. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him and he mounted it. And he went after the man of God and found him sitting under an oak. And he said to him, are you the man of God who came from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said to him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with you or go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, you shall neither eat bread nor drink water there, nor return by the way that you came. And he said to him, I also am a prophet as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of the Lord saying, bring him back with you into your house that he may eat bread and drink water. But he lied to him. So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. Told you, just got weirder. So we have an old prophet and we assume a prophet of God. And it says old prophet, so I assume retired. He's living in the villages. (laughs) Nobody gets that reference. I'm 0 for 3 on people get the villages, right? Shuffleboard and whatever, down in Florida. So he's in the villages, he's retired prophet, and he doesn't have a job right now because everyone's worshiping false gods. But he hears, oh, there's a new preacher in town and he's preaching God's word and the withered hand and the restored hand and the torn down altar. We don't know his motives, but he intercepts this guy and old prophet says to young prophet, come to my house, let's have dinner. Young prophet repeats the word of the Lord. Oh, I was told not only do this prophecy, but neither eat bread nor drink water or go in with anybody or accept dinner invitations. I'm not doing it. And this guy lies. Preachers can lie? He says, oh, I had a sign, something spectacular. It was an angel, really, you're supposed to come. And for whatever reason, the younger prophet believed him. And he goes in and he eats. Don't worry, it gets weirder. If you've read ahead, you know it does. Verse 20. And as they sat at the table, the word of the Lord came to the prophet who had brought him back. Now he gets a real word. The lying prophet gets the real word of God. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah. Thus says the Lord. Here's dinner conversation. Because you have disobeyed the word of the Lord and have not kept the command that the Lord your God commanded you, but have come back and have eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which he said to you, eat no bread and drink no water, your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. Now he gets a real word. And he says, you're going to die because you disobeyed. Verse 23, and after he had eaten bread and drunk, he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he'd brought back. And as he went away, a lion met him on the road and killed him. And his body was thrown in the road and the donkey stood beside it. The lion also stood beside the body. And behold, men passed by and saw the body thrown in the road and the lion standing by the body. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. And when the prophet who had brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, it is the man of God who disobeyed the word of the Lord. Therefore, the Lord has given him to the lion, which has torn him and killed him according to the word that the Lord spoke to him. And he said to his son, saddle the donkey for me. 
and they saddled it. And he went and he found his body thrown in the road and the donkey and the lion standing beside the body. The lion had not eaten the body or torn the donkey. And the prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back to the city to mourn and bury him. And he laid the body in his own grave. And they mourned over him saying, alas, my brother. And after he buried him, he said to his sons, when I die, bury me in the grave in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones. For the saying that he called out by the word of the Lord against the altar in Bethel and against all the houses of the high places that are in the cities of Samaria shall surely come to pass. After this thing, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way, but he made priests for the high places again from among the people. Any who would, he ordained to be priests of the high places. And this thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam so as to cut it off and destroy it from the face of the earth. This is God's word. And just because it's a weird story to us, it doesn't mean there's not something for us. There is something for us. So we get to the end of the story and you have the old prophet who has lied and now he gets a genuine word of the Lord and I wonder the feeling that came over him. He knows he's lied. He knows there was no angel. He's the one who got that guy to deviate from the word and now he's got to tell him because I got you to disobey, you're going to die. Why don't you die? Well, I'm not God, but God's got something to say here. You're going to die. You won't be laid in the tomb of your father. It's a great dishonor. And out of sadness, probably out of guilt, he saddles the donkey for him and he sends us on his way and he gets killed by a lion. I don't know if I get to choose my mode of death. I can think of a lot of things before I'm gonna check lion. He's killed by a lion. And we get the image repeated not once but twice. There's some symbolism here that I think is important for us. And scholars can, you know, we can, we can guess what it's about. But because it's repeated twice, I think God's trying to tell us something. We see a donkey and a lion and a corpse. That's what we see. And the lion didn't eat the corpse and the lion didn't eat the donkey. It's just, it's like it fades out on the lion and the donkey with a dead guy in between. Except for those last words, Jeroboam did not turn from his evil way. And think about all the opportunities he had. He's got four signs now. Heard the sermon, withered arm, restored arm, torn down altar, and the ashes poured out. That's three. And then we got a dead prophet and a lion that didn't eat him. He's got four, but still, you know, that actually gave me a little bit of encouragement because there's times, I'm just going to be honest with you, as a preacher, you preach your guts out, you try to get creative, you do the study, you do the word, you rely on the Holy Spirit and people will still hear over and over and over. You'll come week after week after week and you'll never trust Christ or you'll come once a month for years and years and you'll never repent of sin. You stay hard hearted. Jeroboam had four signs that were pretty spectacular. I would guess that if I could wither and restore arms and break the stage and have a dead guy and a donkey and a lion that somebody would get saved. <laughs> You'd think, but it's not true. Who could know the human heart, right? That was just for me. What can we learn here? There's some important things I think for Important, and, and, and here's a concept that we have, to, we have to drop from our heads straight down into our heart. We see it all throughout, is that God demands and deserves total obedience. He demands and he deserves total obedience. So I don't get to come to this story and say, wow, God's really fickle. Wow, God's really mean. Why do we have to pronounce judgment and this or that? Because he's a for real God. The only God who eternally exists, sovereign in power and authority, the sole righteous one, perfect in his holiness and his love, his mercy and his justice. He is the creator. We are the created. He can demand because he deserves my total obedience. So it isn't that the message of the Bible or the message of Christianity is a mean message. It's not. It's a message of love. 
God demands our obedience. He deserves our obedience. The story of the gospel is he knew that we couldn't perfectly obey. There's only one who's perfectly obeyed. His name was Jesus. And because he perfectly obeyed, he became a perfect sacrifice for those of us who are disobedient. So these stories all throughout the Old Testament and the New reminding us of who we are. Don't ever get tired of it. I am a wicked, disobedient person. But I serve a God who loves me and his son was obedient unto death to pay for my sin. It's a beautiful thing to think about. Jeroboam defied God. He refused to obey the word of the Lord. No, I will set up the Baals. I will set up my false priesthood. I will not trust you. I'll trust myself and my control. Some of us are still defying God. We're playing church and we defy God. We defy God by the way we live our lives. We know what this calls sin. We still choose to do it. We're just like Jeroboam, but we think because we put an you know, offering in the red box and we attend and maybe we serve, maybe we're even on staff. We defy God. That's a dangerous place to be. That's why the word of the Lord came to a prophet. Ooh, I gotta calm down. I might need to get one of those things that says dial it down a bit. My wife's not here with the yellow card. Just Jose, calm down. What were we talking about? Yeah, Jeroboam defied the man of God, oh, this is for me. He deviated from the word. He started out so good in the story. He has the word, do, 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 I'm not gonna eat, not gonna drink, gonna fast the whole way. Did the whole withered hand thing, restored the thing. You know, altar went down, I'm something. Even, you know, turned down a dinner in, invitation. But then he got kind of lured away by someone that goes, but an angel appeared to me. Oh, there's a different word. And he didn't give the total obedience that is demanded and deserved by the one true God. And he paid with his life. And then we see the old retired prophet playing shuffleboard at the villages. What about him? Well, he stopped with the word of the Lord altogether. Got tired of it. I've been to enough church. I've been whatever. But then he heard about a revival and he shows up and he lies about the word of God. Do you know people still lie about the word of God? Do you know people lie about the word of God? Not, not just pastors, imposters, deceivers. Obedience is important, here's why. In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. When you, in faith, trust God and obey him, that proves your faith. That proves that you believe he's a for real God that demands and deserves your total obedience. Some of us claim to have faith. We believe in God, but as it says in the book of James, even demons believe in God. Believing in God won't save you. Faith is what saves by God's grace. Jesus said in John chapter 14, if you love me, you will obey me. First Peter chapter two it says, when we obey in faith, that brings glory to God. And so I just thought it was important. First thing to get out of this is none of this is a fickle God. This is a God who demands and deserves our total obedience. Now, I, I didn't say this perfectly. I, well, I never do. But the fact that I'm saying that you won't perfectly obey doesn't mean that I don't do my best to obey. God knows my heart. Jesus makes a way. His spirit gives us power. But he went to the cross for my disobedience, make no mistake. All right, here's the second thing. This one might hurt a little bit. I don't want it to, but, it's, but it needs to be said. Beware, beware of the God told me conversations. Beware of God told me conversations. Forever you have people from all the way back here to today that wanna appear spiritual, that wanna appear important, that have different motives and different agendas and will say or claim that they have some direct revelation from God. In these last days, it says in Hebrews chapter one, God has spoken to us by his son. He has given us 
his word. We have way more word than Jeroboam or the man of God or the prophet of God. Yes, they may have heard it audibly. God wrote it down for us and he closed it. And the very last line that says, anyone who adds to this or takes away from this shall be accursed. This is the final rule for us. Authoritative, inerrant in its original form. This is for us. It is God's word. 99.9% .9 of God's will for your life is right in there. But forever you have people that says, well, you know, I'm a spiritual person. I had this moment, little tingles. God told me, you know, I have a word for you. I have a Just this morning, God gave me a word for you. Beware of God told me conversations. It cost the man of God from Judah his life. Someone claims something spectacular. Oh, it was an angel. And here's the message. Do I believe God still speaks? Of course. I believe he's speaking right now. By his spirit, he speaks. Yes, he does. The gospel teaches at the moment of salvation, the third person of the Trinity takes up residence in your life to sanctify you, to seal you, a seal of your adoption, to encourage, to teach, to guide, strengthen, empower, comfort. This is the Holy Spirit. Yes, God still speaks. But the God told me will never, ever, ever contradict his word. Let me give you a few examples of this. The person in church that always has the word, as you know, as with you, I just saw um, a, a dancer. Yes, dancer, that's the word for you, dance. It's a word from God, direct revelation. That's happened in our church. Dancer? How about prancer, blitzen, and vixen? <laughs> Where is that in here? That's not in here. You're claiming to have equal authority with God's word. Beware of the God told me conversations. I was talking to another member of staff who was, who was biblically counseling someone to try to help their marriage. They had questions, they had answers. It was all out of God's word over and over and over. And then a friend gave the dude a God told me that this is his plan for you and this is what he has for you. He comes to counseling, tells this pastor, I'm supposed to check out of this marriage because a guy told, or God told a guy. And, and that's the thing. Ruination, wife, children, decades. You, you don't think it still happens? I got one more and I'm on a tear and it's the third service, so you're welcome. Here we go. <laughs> Eclipse last week. Oh, my days. Every celestial movement and all the moonies and the freak shows and the cult people. I watched no less than five people on the interwebs. Start with, I have received something to share with you. Now, there were five, four, four of least were women, has nothing to do with women or men, but for whatever reason, a bunch of women were into the eclipse. They had this, God told me about this eclipse and I need to share it with you. You know what crushed my heart? 20,000 views, 35,000 views, 50,000 views. Why are we listening to these idiots? Because we're just as gullible. Guys, when did his word become not enough? Do we got to chase something else and be deceived? First Thessalonians set, uh, chapter five says, test everything by his word. Galatians chapter one, verse eight says that any other gospel, even if it's preached to you by angels, don't listen to it. And then we... We read in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, the prophet who claims to have a prophecy from God and lies about it is worthy of death. There's one other place we gotta go, and I'll try to be quick here. 2 Timothy chapter three. Because forever people wanna know are we living in the last days? Yes, we're living in the last days. The moment Jesus ascended into heaven, we've been living in the last days. But 2 Timothy chapter 3, we're, it's not going to go on the screen. You should have brought a Bible. <laughs> but uh, sorry, was that obvious? Uh, that, that was kind of obvious, yeah. All right. You can have flat screen. That's fine. Just stop playing Candy Crush. Um, it says, but understand this, verse 1, in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Check out this list. Tell me if this checks out for us. 
People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They'll have the appearance of godliness but deny its power. Avoid such people. Does that sound like us? Check, 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 check. We're in the last days. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning, never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. You can know a lot about this, claim that God told me and lead a bunch of people astray, straight to their death. Verse 10, you have, however, followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love and steadfastness, my persecution, my persecutions and sufferings. In verse 12, he says, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. He's telling us it's going to get bad. Verse 13, evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Do you know that there are evil, deceiving imposters in churches? They're in our church. They become small group leaders. They get on staff. Some of them become pastors. They use it for their gain. Anyone claiming to speak for God's word, it will never contradict his word. I have a word from the Lord. I have an insight. I have a special thing. You always go, show me. Show me. You can't show me. I don't hear you. Verse 15, he says, but you from childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings. They're able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You know what he's saying? This is the word that you need right here. You don't live in the Old Testament. He's given you his word. The canon is closed. You can't add to this. You can't take away. Some of you come from church traditions where the church's word was equal to that word. That's not true. That's not true. No pastor can supersede this. Neither can a pope. Scripture cannot be broken. It's the only word we need. We gotta land this plane. Some of you don't know this, but right here on this table, made for me by Terry Umler, there's this little thing, uh, this little uh, metal plate, and it's engraved. Uh, it's a little reminder. It says, we wish to see Jesus. So that's where we're gonna land, if that's okay with you. We wish to see Jesus. Where's Jesus? Well, look at the symbology of the donkey and the lion. The donkey has a symbolism in the Bible of servanthood. The prophet is a servant. The prophet brought the word of the Lord to Jeroboam, whose heart stayed hard. Even though the prophet didn't get it right, it, it's a symbol of the prophet. It's a symbol that the word of the Lord has come to you. It's God's mercy. And God's mercy was shown to Jeroboam. He didn't deserve to have the word. He didn't deserve to have his hand restored. He was shown mercy twice, four signs. What does the lion represent? God's justice. And weirdly, or for whatever reason, at least in my human brain, it was the man of God that made a mistake and deviated from the word who suffered God's justice, killed by a lion. And so we see this symbol of God's mercy and his justice. How does it point to Jesus? The way it points to him is Jesus embodies God's mercy and justice. He is the embodiment. You want to know what God's mercy looks like? You look at Jesus. You, know what his, you want to know what his justice looks like? You look at Jesus. God in his mercy knew that none of us could perfectly obey the God that demands it and deserves it. So someone has to die. And it could be all of us, or he could offer up his son as a sacrifice. So God's mercy goes to the cross in the form of Jesus. The cross is the instrument, the lion of his justice that demands blood payment for my failure. And at the cross, God's mercy and his justice collide. And it was brutal and it was gross. And we just celebrated it at Easter. 
But that's where grace was born. Grace was born at the cross that I didn't have to go. God will get justice for those that do not perfectly obey him. You either let Jesus pay for it or God will let you pay for it. I didn't make the rules. Those are the rules. That's how it works. Well, I don't like it. Well, you go, girl. <laughs> Just you do you then. Good luck. There's no other way. There's no other way. And so when it says in Hebrews that in many times in the last days God spoke to his prophets, now he has revealed himself by his son. He has spoken to us by his son. Thankfully, we have the gospel and we see the symbology of this donkey and this lion, this mercy and this justice. And that's where Jesus shows up because we're reminded, we just celebrated a few weeks ago, that the servant king, the Messiah, it was prophesied in Zechariah, I think chapter nine, that the Messiah king would come triumphantly on a donkey. Would he not? It says in Revelation chapter five that he will come again as the lion of Judah. Now for Israel, they are represented in the dead corpse. That's a type of Israel. When I say type, some of you are familiar with that, the typology of the Bible. And the symbol is the word came in on a donkey. You had the word. You deviated, Jeroboam defied, you lied about. And so here's God's mercy, here's God's justice, and you are spiritually dead laying in between the two. Why else would the lion not kill and not eat the corpse? It's a picture for us. Because we're between the two as well. The servant king who came into Jerusalem triumphant, will come again. It says that when he comes, he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. I'm old school Bible thumper right now. This is for all my Baptists. Ready? Here we go. Right there. That's what it says. That's what it says. But don't miss his love. Don't miss his love. None of us deserve salvation. None of us deserve to have a withered hand restored. But God wants to show his love and he wants to show his mercy. There's nothing he can't forgive. There's no new start you can't have. But while we live between those two animals, the man who came on the donkey, the one that returns as a lion, we stand between, what will you do? What will you do? It's like two bookends. Are you spiritually dead? Some of us, we've called ourselves Christians. We've been spiritually dead a long time. We've checked out. It's just something we go to. And then you could be young, you could be old. I don't know who you are, but you're spiritually dead, dead, dead. Some of us have never even been alive. We've never come to Christ. We're like Jeroboam, hard heart, week after week after week. We're like, oh yeah, he told a few cokes and jokes or whatever. None of that matters if you don't hear the truth. And I believe God in his mercy by his spirit is speaking to some of us now that's saying it's time. It's time to get after it for the kingdom. It's time to say yes for the king in the kingdom. For some of us, it's time to repent of those things that you think you're getting away with. You're not getting away with it. Come back next week. God sees everything. There's your preview. He knows. He knows. And before the lion comes, respond to the messenger on the donkey. Receive his mercy. Receive his mercy. That's the message. I'm done. So will you bow your heads? We're going to sing. We're going to sing one more time. But I want to leave a space for you to ask, God, what are you saying to me? If there's sin in your life, if you've been disobedient, you have a hard heart, you've deviated from the truth, it's time to repent and turn back. If you've never become a Christian, the invitation is to become one. If you need encouragement today, please don't hear in the passion of my voice anger. Hear exactly that. It's passion. Some people misunderstand that. It's passion and it's love for you 
And more than that, it's love for Christ and his gospel. God, I thank you for your word. Forgive us for spiritual deadness. Forgive us for the times we use your word to deceive or to lie. God, I don't think I've ever done that. But we're not perfect. God, thank you for those times we're not perfect and we fail. For those times that we try to puff ourselves up thinking we have direct revelation, thank you that we still have Jesus. Thank you that when we're frightened of the Lion of Judah that will come, that we can look at Jesus and no, 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 I'm safe because I know him and he knows me. God, I pray right now that many would turn to you for the first time or turn back to you. God, that we would be encouraged. That we would turn back to your word, which is for us. It's not about us, but it's for us. Thank you for loving us. In Christ's name and for his sake, we pray. Amen.